So let's say now you have you have analyzed 20 companies per week or like at 500 when we open application, we have somewhere between 600 to 1,000 companies applying per batch. You need to sort of decide what you want to do, like which companies you want to invest. And uh, we're really glad to have Tomas Corte here with us. If you, I'm actually curious to know who, who knows who Angel Pat is here in the audience. Okay, for those who doesn't know who Angel Pat is, you should definitely look at what they do. They are always uh, selected, voted as one of the best accelerators uh, in the country. And it, you started in 2010 uh, in the Bay Area and also has the operation, apparently moved to New York too. That's right. <laughs> Tomas, please tell us how do you select out, like you see all those great things, what do you do to select them and help them grow too? I'll do that. Um. Thanks for having me, and, and uh, thanks for all of you to, uh, to be here. Um, it disheartens me to see only like five hands going up, um, but I have to blame just myself because uh, we are not very loud in the marketplace. We don't talk much about us. Um, we're usually very quiet and have our deal fall very in internally from, uh, from companies that, have, that know us or that, that have gone through the program. But let me tell you a little bit about what I'll be talking about, about uh, who I am, what I do, and uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time to take, take questions as well. So, First thing is I changed the name of the, uh, of the talk. Rather than picking companies, which is the easy part, it's about picking the winners, um, you know, because that's where the money comes back. Picking companies is just spending money. Picking winners is actually making money with them. Um, I'm on Twitter. Twitter is Thomas K. But why, why do I even stand up here and tell you anything about selecting companies? Um, I've made about 120 investments over the past uh, six years, uh, the vast majority of them as personal investments. I've only had an LP fund for about the, the past year, and it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fund. Um, to date, we've had uh, 15 exits. Many of them actually are doing um, still really well. The companies, 15 have exited uh, with a total exit value of just over, over a billion, billion dollars. And I think there's going to be a few more coming. Now, what you don't see on this slide um, is all the companies that I met and talked to uh, to get those uh, to those 120. So I've I've met with um, um, or screened about 15,000 companies to select these 100, uh, 120 companies. AngelPad um, is is really is this, yeah AngelPad is a is a mentorship program. Uh, we run uh, we run like an accelerator. You know, two cohorts per year in San Francisco and New York. We select about 15 companies per cohort, and we get about 2,000 applications. We interview about um, you know two to 300 companies in person to select the 15. And our our general thesis is that um, you know very very broadly speaking, not as focused as 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 Pedro um, is that you know if we help companies at the very earliest stage, you know literally within six, eight, 12 months of founding the companies usually just the founders, if we help them with everything at that point in a really, really intensive manner, there's going to be, uh, um, you know, the delta between, uh, between success and time to success is going to be much larger. And um, to date, I think we've proven that true um, with the exits that we have. But we're, still, we're still, you know, changing our model. We're still figuring things a lot, out, a lot of things out. We are a startup um, just a few years old um, that, is, that is modifying a lot of things um, all the time. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, actually this last week by, at South By, they, they released the, uh, the official rankings. This is about the only uh, um, true ranking where all the data is correlated. It's a co uh, collaboration between Rice University and MIT. They get all the data, all the valuations, all the exit values, everything. Um, they, they survey all the founders that have gone through the programs and rank them. They did about 200 um, accelerators, and I'm very happy to say that we came out, out first on that one. But you all knew that if you listened to Dave McClure last year on stage here, or rather in San Francisco, where he said it's probably the best accelerator program in the US. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's actually very incestuous because Dave is an LP in the fund, uh, Pedro is an LP in the fund, so, uh, so it's all it comes around, goes around here. Um, but let's talk about uh, the uh, selecting companies and selecting founders specifically. Now, remember, I talk about very, very early stage. I talk about really seed stage and you know, not even A, like, you know, the pre-A. So anything that is like, you know, two million, or sorry, a million to three million dollars in new money into the company, valuations of, you know, five million to 10 million, you know, plus minus uh, two million on, on each side. That's what I'm talking about, which I think is a very different way of selecting companies than in the A rounds and the B rounds and C rounds, where you have a lot more information, a lot more quantitative data about the companies. Um, so unlike what was said earlier in the, in the panel, um, I think it's really important that you do fall in love first. You really do want to fall in love with these, invest with these founders. But then you want to spend a lot of time in rationalizing if you actually want to get married. 
Um, so don't just fall in love and run off to Vegas and get married to these founders. Um, you have many, many years ahead with them. And I think it's the, uh, the rationalizing of should I make these investments after you really like the founder and really like the team and see yourself possibly working with them in a small manner um, is, is, is where the hard work comes in. And that's what I'll be talking about, the rationalizing the investments. And when you look at, broadly speaking, you know, this is no news to, to any of you, but it's about the market, the team, the vision, the product, and the traction. Those are the, uh, the five things that everybody's looking at. Those are the things that I tell my founders that they need to be able to articulate very clearly, very crisply, and have thought about in, in much depth about all of them. And this is what we spent 12 weeks doing with them. Uh, we don't you know, build the product next to them. We don't explain to them how to hire. We don't you know, do all these, these things that you can learn or read somewhere. It's really like the in-depth, every single company individually, you know, which market they're going after. Is there a bigger market? Um, you know, what, uh, what, what do we need to do about the team? What kind of team do we have to build to make this a, make this a, a large company? What's the vision, the really big vision behind this? Um, because you know, let's face it, unless you have a really big vision for something, you'll, you'll probably never get there. Like you want to you wanna shoot for, uh, for the moon and land on the stars. And if you don't have a founder that is willing to do that and, and has this vision, you'll just have very small chances of, of a very large outcome. And you know, as much as I love founders and love working with them every day, um, I am a financially driven investor. Um, so if it, if it doesn't have a chance of making money, I will not do it. Um, though we do have the .org in our domain, the .com was squatted, and they, they will not give it to us. Um, um, we, we are a for-profit, and I think that's really important um, for all of us in the room always to remember, even the pro bono that was alluded to earlier, um, even the pro bono investors, quote-unquote pro bono investors, have a financial return uh, motive. And, and um, let me jump to the next slide. Um, you know, this is a quote from Warren Buffett. Um, if you have a great, uh, if, if a great team meets a lousy market, it's the market's reputation that stays intact. And it's something that I've really, really taken to heart. Um, early on when I invested, um, I looked always at the team first, and I got very excited about the fact, you know, if, if you found a great team, some ex-Google engineers, rock stars, great reputation, building something, you know, I, I could get very excited. Um, but a few times it happened that those founders actually had, you know, fairly small ideas, and, and the market that they were going after was just, didn't sustain a large company, and the companies um, eventually failed um, or, or pivoted. Uh, that was the, the better case outcome. And I think it's really important that when you start looking at big outcomes, that you start with a big market. And if you don't start with a big market, it doesn't matter what everything else you have, you will not be able to have a large outcome. It doesn't matter if you have a rock star team. It doesn't matter if you have crazy traction. Um, the market has to sustain the outcome. Um, but the market is also something that is it's not just what is there today. Um, when you look at the, uh, the tech unicorns that everyone's talking about, the companies that are valued over a, a billion dollars, um, you know, they all operate in a really large market. Uh, it's, you know, Zenefits in insurance, um, Instacart in groceries, Uber in transportation, Snapchat in communication. Every single one of those is a multi-billion dollar market. Um, but some of these markets weren't multi-billion dollar markets when they pitched the seed. Um, take Uber, for example. Uber basically pitched, and I still have the email from the original pitch, um, they pitched a service for really wealthy people to get a black car much easier than having their admin do it, you know, at home or in, in their office. Um, that was what Uber pitched, but the vision was, was far beyond that. So sometimes it's really about the future market and, and what, what can be done in the future using mostly new technologies because that's, that's you know, certainly where I believe most of you want to invest in. What I only invest in is, is in technology-driven companies. And having founders that see these future markets, have a thesis around it, and really go after them, I think is, 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 is really, really key uh, to an existing market to disrupt, but also a future market that today doesn't exist, but they already see or start seeing. Now, some examples, if people today talk about you know, the connected home, and not the connected home where like, your nest tells you that your house is on fire on your cell phone, uh, but, but like a, a way more intelligent home, you know, something that is, is as smart as some of the systems that we see in, in uh, in, you know, in our cell phone, um, you know, where, where you know, your filter is being changed by, by technology or get alerted to. Um, you know, those are really big markets that today basically don't exist. Um, the same with, with cars. Most of the technology, we pay more money for our cars than any other technology piece that we own. And the technology that is in the car is appallingly simple. Um, and, and there's big disruption to be done. And there's a lot of cars out there. So these future markets is really, really important to look at. The team. Um, you know, most investors will tell you it comes down to the team is the most important part in your investment decision. And 
I tend to agree. Once you have a big market, the team certainly, like if, if you don't have the team, and by the way, all these things kind of go in hand in hand, but if you don't have um, this, this great, you know, passionate, hungry, driven team, and that's, you know, uh, I, you, know you look for, for, for humble entrepreneurs, I look for passionate, hungry, driven people to just, you know, they can't do anything else but their startup. And then I look for an unfair advantage. And that has come up a couple of times. You know, I'm looking for people, and I think everybody should look for people that have this unique insight, this unfair advantage, something that they've experienced, something that they have known from uh, either you know, personal experiences or from, uh, from work experience and have a connection to the very problem. Founders that are just opportunistic, finding a big market and kind of building the company around that market um, is, is not my cup of tea and I haven't seen them succeed, you know, out succeed the, the, the other founders that truly believe in, in, in what they're doing every day. You know, they go to the work, to work, they have to go to work every day and you might as well rather do something um, that you truly understand and love and that is what that unfair advantage is. Um, vision, vision, and more important than vision, even the ambition to have that vision. Um, you know, when founders come to us, we kind of, you know, do the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, the throw on the deep side of the pool question. It's like, you know, what's the vision? What's the biggest thing you can possibly see this being, you know, in five years, in ten years? And, you know, it's, it's really difficult for most founders, for most anybody, to truly think outside the box and say, this could be really large. This could be, you know, completely changing something we do. And oftentimes it sounds just utterly silly when you, when you hear yourself saying it, you know, and, and you know, Uber is a, is a great example for that too. You know, if you, uh, if you have the ambition to fundamentally change how people are moving around, eventually how stuff is moving around, you know, articulating that vision and telling somebody, like, dude, you're smoking something. You know, this is, this is, isn't it a bit too big with your... You know, starting with your little limos and then, you know, going, going to changing the world or, or Airbnb, you know, fundamentally changing how we, how we, 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 we travel and how we, how we stay in, in, in different cities. And the ambition to get there, um, the drive and passion is really what, what great founders are about and what great companies come together. And with the vision ambition, you have a team that can articulate that to other people because the hardest part um, in technology today is hiring. Um, certainly in San Francisco, New York, and sooner or later it's going to be the same thing in Miami. Um, you know, finding, finding the people and inspire, inspiring to work for your company instead of the 20 other companies that offer the same benefits and the same money and the same you know, cool office with uh, lava lamps and free coffee and free everything, um, it's, it's just there. So why is it your company? And the vision is what, what makes people want to work at a, at a, at a company. Um, Product and design, and this is almost very specific to angel investors or relatively new investors. They spend a lot of time looking at the product that the company has built already. Um, I don't look at the product that a company has built. I don't care about what they've built. A matter of fact, whatever they have built, we're probably going to rebuild in the next six to 12 months anyway. But what I do look at is the product design and the design sensibilities of the team. Not just the visual design, but how do they use technologies and mesh them together to come up with something new. Um, and, and what is their understanding of the, the UX and the UI that will interact with the user, the individual if it's a B2C company or, or, or the business user if it is a B2B company. And that's where the, the product part comes, comes in really, uh, really, really strongly. A lot of investors spend way too much time looking at the current product that a company has built. And the last thing is traction. And early on someone said, you know, if all in doubt, just invest in traction. And I think in later stage rounds, it's actually true. Um, in seed stage and A stage, I have seen that traction is often a missing indicator of success, uh, a, a, a false indicator of success. Look at this graph here. Um, there's two companies. Where the box is, is where you will be investing. Which company will you be investing at? Right? If you take off everything that goes up and to the right and you basically make a line, oops, sorry. If you make a line where the, uh, where the boxes are, you will invest in the company that is further up, right? More traction. But when you look at truly successful companies, they almost all of them have an inflection point where they start having a hyper growth and an exponential growth. And most, most often, I don't see companies having a hyper growth with a strong initial traction growth. They have nothing, 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 nothing. It bubbles around and all of a sudden it explodes up. And that's the kind of company that I'm looking for personally rather than the company that is you know, six or eight months old and already has revenue and uh, you know, can very predictably track that. Now, 
on the flip side of this, I'm not saying tra uh, traction is bad because traction is very good, but traction is an indicator that someone is paying something for whatever you have to offer. And having early traction is a, is, a, is a very nice way to validate that because if people say, oh, I like this, the next question should be, do you like it enough to pay for it? And if people actually do pay for it, that's a, a pretty valid, uh, valid uh, uh, point that you're actually solving someone's problem. But oftentimes, we actually ask our companies to just you know, stop thinking about the money you know, after they have a certain amount, and then really rethink how can we get from, from a linear growth to an explosive growth. And oftentimes, that means actually not having revenue for some time. So if I, if I round it up in one sentence, what, what, what you should be looking for is smart, driven, charismatic founders with an unfair advantage, um, uh, uh, with an unfair advantage taking on a huge market using technology as a leverage, and you really like them. Because at the end of the day, you, know, you spend time on actually meeting them and, and over time interacting with them. And if you do, do take that time to make direct investments, you might as well do it with people that you like and enjoy being with, because otherwise you can just give money to Pedro and to, to Dave and to me and manage your money and, and, and uh, never have to, uh, to worry about, about meeting these, these, uh, these founders. And with that, hopefully I have some time to, uh, to uh, uh, have some questions. Oh, really quickly, if you go to angelpad.org, you actually get like an update twice a year with all of our companies um, and like a login to, to talk to me and things like that. So you should, you should all be doing that. Go ahead. So, uh, terrific talk. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you, let me quote you early on. You said, we help them with everything. Yes. Can you be more specific as to what kind of things you help them with? Do you, as an example, do you house them? Yes. Okay, can you, so when you house, house them, them or feed them, lots now, of beer. Now you're, they're right under your nose. You, <laughs> yes. really, you really do house them. Yes, we really do house them. So very, very core part of AngelPad is that we are, um, this is actually the AngelPad office in New York that you see there through glass, some artistic picture. Um, but um, it's very important for us to be in the same place. Um, we call it the bubble because no one else comes in there. There's, there's us, the two partners and the founders. There's no employees, there's no mentors, there's no investors, there's, there's no service provider, there's nobody in there. Um, it's us with the companies every day. And it's, it's very specific to individual companies. You know, of course, we have group talks where we talk about fundraising in general or, or you know, maybe product design, um, some more specific, uh, you know, even down to, uh, I don't know, like to AdWords or, or, or you, know, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, Twitter ads or something like this, you know, a lot of these stuff, but we have all the expertise um, within the team. Um, what we really do is, you know, most of you mentor companies, right? And you see them maybe every two weeks, maybe every month or so, and you kind of check in and you, you imagine we do that, but we have a one day iteration, right? We see them Monday, we see them again Tuesday, we see them again Wednesday, we see them again Thursday. You know, we see them for half an hour, they spend work 20 hours, and then we see them again for half an hour. Um, and so we have very, very fast iterations. Don't hire people. We don't help them hire people, no. They're usually not at the stage where they need to hire people. The people that we accept into AngelPad usually have the technical skills to build what they have to build. Um, and um, so hiring, hiring is not part of that. Hiring is usually comes past the seed round. I want to go back to your slide about investing in traction. And I'm curious about your experience in investing in traction. Uh, the conventional wisdom uh, in startup investments when you're getting in early is that you're going to completely lose your money on half your investments. Uh, but what you're presenting here in terms of investing in traction is, you know, although oh, you want to invest in the exponential growth case, that linear growth case is not that bad, actually. You most likely won't lose your money. But I'm curious, it's in your true, experience, yeah. when a company has reasonable traction, how often do you still lose your money? I, so it's, um, it's actually remarkably few times that we actually lose our money um, because most of these companies have built phenomenal, so this is the, down, like the downside protection that you all should be thinking about that no one ever talks about. The downside protection of, of technology is that you have an accu hire and if you have a team that builds great technology, hires great engineers, you will be able to sell this company and more or less recoup, recoup your investment um, around that. Um, so so that the complete downside of losing money is actually very small um, if, you're, if you're well if you have a well curated um, uh, um, portfolio, I think here you know, you know the the up and to the right. Yeah, it, it does it does look okay. Um, and if I'm like a Wall Street investor, that looks fantastic. You know, it just goes up and to the right forever. Fantastic. Um, but you're right. You know, there are companies that are failing, and and so we may recoup our investment. Um, you know, there's a disproportionate amount 
that are failing, and, and we want them to fail, right? Not all of them can be billion dollar exits. Um, the companies that kind of go like this, they just don't, they're just not enough of them to, uh, to pay for the failure. Um, so we need to have the exponential growth. And, you know, for, for the founders, for the investors, for, for, uh, for us, the early mentors, it's exactly the same work to create a company with, an, with a hockey stick curve than a company with a linear growth. Um, so we'd rather go for the hockey stick um, with a higher chance of failing than, than having the safe, safe bet, um, which is, is safer, but still not you know, a very safe. David is gonna just whip, whiplash me for this one. Go ahead, David. <laughs> oh, uh, the plus one. Actually, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a softball one. So uh, you guys have had a very, very large exit with Mopub, uh, which was acquired by Twitter. Uh, and I don't know if you can state the amount, but I would guess that that was pretty close to a unicorn, at least when Twitter went public. Yeah, um, I guess two, two questions. One is, did you do any follow-on investment in that uh, after the initial incubation stage? And knowing what you know now, would you have advised them to sell to Twitter or wait? Um, so, so I don't want to go too much into detail about the specifics because they were by, acquired by a, a publicly traded company and they're still operating inside of that company. Um, but I think, yes, we did, we did make follow-on investments. Um, like I said, I didn't have a fund until a, a, about a year and a half ago, so it was actually just me personally making those follow-on investments. Um, and we, we uh, just because it was my personal money, we've been very selective in making follow-on investments, and they were actually not were not taking our entire pro rata. Um, I think, you know, seeing what I want now, would I advise them to to uh, to exit or not? It's really not my role to advise them or not. You know, this is three years out where I spend every day with them. You know. Past Angel Pat, I become you know, good friends with most of the founders and I become that buddy they go to. I'm not the day-to-day -day advisor. You know, they had Excel, they had, they had uh, um, uh, a Michael Deering to really talk to them day-to-day. -day. I think there's a, there's a point where every company will exit, you know, either to the public markets or, or to, uh, to the private markets. Generally speaking, as my investor head on, if a company that is about to go public that is as prominent as Twitter wants to acquire you four days before they go public, that is not a bad outcome. I think we have one last question, yeah. Oh, well, two last questions, okay, one, two. One last question from Ben, and now we'll hold the second one. Okay, okay, good. So, so sorry, I, I was just um, gonna follow up on the linear versus exponential. You mentioned that you try to take companies from linear to exponential. I'm just wondering what you do in order to kind of make that change. It's, you know, if I, if I could give you a formula, um, I would publish it and sell a book and probably make more money. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's, you know, it, there is no formula. It is hard work every single day. It's like they're all different companies, they're all different industries, they're all different problems. Um, and it really is just, you know, for the most part, being there, going through these problems and, and addressing things head on. You know, um, what I found is that uh, today, a lot of founders have, have very, very little kind of mirror that's being held up. <clears throat> um, excuse me. <clears throat> and, and, you know, if we're in a position where we are, investors so early on, and we're pretty significant investors in all these companies, um, that we can be that, right? And we've built that relationship, you know, sitting next to them, you know, they know if I yell, it's not because I'm angry, it's because out of passion. You know, they, they know, I know if they yell back, I know exactly where they're coming from because I I've, I've know them. We're, we've been at boot camp together, um, you know, for three months. So I think, I think there is no easy answer on how to do that, uh, apart from like hard work. And I think the one, the one secret sauce, and it's not that secret is, you start with an enormous application pool, you're very diligent in screening them, and you end up with a tiny, tiny group of people that you actually work with. Thank you very much. Thank you.